God apparently has been speaking to my wife because last I checked, I only had eight. <laughs> Did she call you this morning with an announcement for me? <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. If you have five or more, you have a hard time remembering how many you have, much less that what your friends have. So I totally feel you, Scott. Um, that's, uh, that's fine. But uh, praise be to God. Oh, it's, it's so wonderful to, uh, to be here with you this morning. I was reflecting this morning at what a, what a privilege and an honor it is uh, to share this uh, stage uh, with, with Scott and with Ted uh, and, and so many others uh, who have um, done so much for Scripture education in the country and uh, to, to be with these fine colleagues and uh, to be able to present to you is a real honor. And it's an honor to be with you because uh, you are on the front lines of uh, biblical teaching and the spreading of the gospel and the new evangelization in your parishes around the country. Um, you know, at least I get paid for this. <laughs> you, you guys are doing this out of the, uh, you know, the, the goodness of your heart at your own expense. Uh, and... Um, uh, you know, not a professional Bible scholar, but uh, you're putting your talents um, at, the, at the use of the church and of God in such a self-sacrificial way, and I salute you, I honor you, and uh, it's such a privilege to be able to be here with you and share something that maybe you'll find useful, I hope, in your ministries in the different parts of the country where you have uh, come from. So, uh, we have um, up above me the, uh, the title of this talk here, Love is the Highest Wisdom. And uh, we're going to be talking this morning about an odd wisdom book. It's been alluded to uh, already uh, by Dr. Hahn and others, uh, The Song of Songs. It's, uh, it's an odd book. It's, it's kind of like the West Virginia of biblical books, you know? It's like... <laughs> What do you do with West Virginia, really? It's not the Midwest. It's not really the South, you know, because they didn't join the Confederacy. It's not the East Coast, you know? So you can't, you can't plug it into any category. It's just like, it's just there, you know? Like, you know, you can't, don't know what to do with it, you know? It's not a Great Lakes state, really. It doesn't touch the Great Lakes. So, you know, you can't, you can't figure out what to do with West Virginia. Song of Songs is like that. It's like, what do you do with this book? Um, it's, a, it's ascribed to Solomon, but it's not like Proverbs. It's not like the other uh, wisdom literature. Um, it's a little bit like Psalms, you know, like Psalm 45, but aside from Psalm 45, you know, not so much like the other Psalms. Uh, it's not history. It's not law, you know, so... Song of Songs uh, it can defy our categories, but I'm going to uh, argue that it really does belong with the wisdom literature. You know, because people you know, ask the question, you know, what, what is this book? Um, I'm sorry, what do we got here going on? All right, I'm trying to coordinate things. All right. There we go. Okay, all right. We'll just have to run with this. My uh, animations are not working on the uh, uh, screen that you have displayed before you. So yeah, so you know the Song of Songs. You know, what, y- y- you read it and like this seems like a bunch of cringy, uh, you know, love poetry. Like it's all thrown together. But but maybe I'm supposed to do something with this. You know, maybe these are like biblically endorsed pickup lines. You know, this is, that's, that's how I encourage my, men's, my, my male students to look at this and say, guys, you really got to try this. You know, you got to, trust me, go down to the J.C. Williams. You see that cute theology major that you'd like to get to know better. All you got to do is go up to her and say, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I couldn't help notice, but your, your hair is like a flock of goats descending Mount Gilead. <laughs> This is really how I foster vocations to the priesthood. (laughs) 
But I'm like, no, no, it really, it really works. You know, I know from personal experience, you know, my wife loves it, you know. Yeah. She's sitting there doing, doing dishes at the kitchen sink, you know, and I come up and, you know, do that sidle up, you know, arms around the waist thing, and then I kind of lean in next to her ear and I whisper, honey, your belly is like a heap of wheat. <laughs> Tell you, she just swoons. I mean, that's... That's how you keep the home fires burning after 25 years and eight children. I tell you, it's a song of songs, gentlemen. Just don't know what you're missing. But um, more seriously, the, the Song of Songs is a collection of ancient love poems. That's true, it is. And, and sometimes we don't always appreciate the imagery. You know, your uh, neck is like the Tower of David, or, you know, your eyes are like the pools of Heshbon. But... Um, but there's actually theological significance to that. Uh, we may get a chance to talk about some of that. But these different love poems have been brought together and arranged with a loose kind of plot. So, um, you know, scholars wonder, you know, what is, uh, you know, does it belo- really belong with the wisdom book? As I alluded to earlier, it's, uh, it's not didactic like uh, Proverbs or Sirach, you know, with instructions like go to the ant thou sluggard or something like that, teaching fortitude. You don't find that kind of um, genre in the Song of Songs. Um, and yet it's associated with Solomon, and in, in both in Judaism and within Christianity, it's often been read as kind of the culmination of the wisdom literature, as the highest of the wisdom books. Like the famous Rabbi Akiva uh, says, all scripture is holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. In some sense, this ancient rabbi had the, uh, the conviction that this book was the highest of a certain trajectory that was going on in ancient uh, scripture. So let's talk about the structure of the Song of Songs. It basically has uh, a chiastic structure. This is a little term that you can take back to impress your friends. Um, What did you learn at Francisco? I learned about chiasms. (laughs) I sure did. (laughs) What is a chiasm? C-H-I-A-S-M. Chi is the uh, Greek word for X. So um, uh, chiasm is an X-shaped uh, structure that kind of moves towards a middle point, and you often find this in biblical literature. And um, in the Song of Songs, you find that there's these successive frames, like the beginning and the end balance, and you move in, and the second and the second to last balance, and so on towards a middle point. So the opening of the um, Song of Songs is what we call a colloquy. A colloquy is a section of a play or a a drama where most of the players have a speaking part. So you, you can, you can um, view the Song of Songs as a, as a play, a theatrical production, even something like a musical where you have um, sung or spoken parts for different actors. And the, the three main voices in the Song of Songs are the bride, the groom, and the chorus, which is a group called the Daughters of Jerusalem. They're a group, and they chime in periodically with, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, a harmony number uh, to the melody of the bride and the groom. But in the first uh, chapter, roughly, and bleeding into the second chapter of the Song of Songs, you get a colloquy where everybody comes out on stage, the bride, the groom, the chorus, and they all have speaking parts, and they dialogue with each other. After that's over, you have a kind of an interlude where the bride, uh, excuse me, the groom essentially uh, bounds down out of the hills and invites the bride to run off with him. Uh, That's song 2, verses 8 through 17. Uh, It's interesting, we, I don't know if anybody knows when in the church's lectionary we read song 2. Uh, But it might not uh, be what you'd expect. It's full of uh, springtime imagery with uh, flowers and um, uh, birds and, uh, you know, this invitation to run off to the hills together. And so you might think, well, that would fit maybe in the springtime of the year somewhere, maybe in Easter after Lent or what have you. 
But actually, we read it around December 21 or 22nd, just a few days before Christmas. Like, what? Why read this springtime love poem, okay, in the coldest time of the year when it's almost the darkest it's going to get, and just before Christmas where we're not thinking about marriage and stuff, but we're thinking about babies and, you know, this little child born to us and so on. Well, the reason we do use this, this uh, as it were, engagement uh, poem just before uh, the birth of our Lord is that the church fathers saw Christmas as a kind of marriage. It was the marriage of divine nature with human nature in one person. And isn't uh, marriage uh, where the two become one, right? Where you can have one person of the two, And so the groom bounding down out of the hills, that was seen as the second person of the Trinity who comes to wed himself to us, human nature, as his bride. And he makes of divine nature and human nature one person in this baby. So Jesus is a wedding in a person right there. He's a marriage right there in the manger. And um, the, uni- the union of, of human and divine. So a beautiful thing. So that's the second uh, section of the Song of Songs. We move into the next section, and we have the first of two major dream sequences uh, that we find in this poem, where the bride is asleep at night, and she uh, has a bad dream where her groom is missing, and so she goes out into the city, and she searches around for him, and uh, eventually finds him. And then the center of the Song of Songs is a vision of Solomon coming up into Jerusalem in his bridal litter, or the technical term is a palanquin, which is a, a kind of a room on poles that was carried by soldiers, you know, for kings and emperors and so on. Kind of the, the ultimate uh, sweet ride. It's like your, you know, your luxury Cadillac of, uh, of the Bronze Age, okay? So um, he comes riding into Jerusalem in this, uh, in this elaborate, luxurious, uh, you know, room on, a, on, on poles. And uh, the way I interpret the Song of Songs, after you see this vision of him being carried up, you actually go inside the room. I think this is what Song 4 is, chapter 4. You go inside this uh, bridal litter where Solomon and his bride are being carried into Jerusalem and they're having a conversation and he's telling her how beautiful she is. You know, she's as fair as the doves and you have these, these wonderful visual descriptions. And she uh, responds and you have that dialogue between bride and groom that finally ends in uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Then you start backing out in the structure of the book and you get the bride's second dream sequence the same basic plot as in chapter 3, uh, 1 through 5, but now told uh, at much, uh, uh, much greater um, uh, detail. And then uh, in the uh, second to last section of the book, you get a kind of a correspondence to the second section because, you know, in, in chapter 2, the groom comes and says to the bride, run off with me, and then in uh, chapter 6, 11, he actually shows up with a chariot and tells her, hey, baby, jump in. So she does, and they roar off. I don't know what it is about guys and, and means of transportation, you know? <laughs> but I, it's this old. You know, when I was a kid in, in, in high school, you know, you wanted to have a, like a Dodge Duster, some kind of muscle car. That was really cool. That was the way to, you know, get girls, you know? And, and it's, it's as old as Jane Austen. I don't know if anybody watches Jane Austen films and stuff like that, but you watch these romances and the guys are always bragging about, I've got a barouche, you know? And that's, apparently that was like a really cool carriage in 1804, you know, in England. You had to have a barouche, you know? And then you go, you go back to the Song of Songs and the guy's got a chariot, you know? <laughs> Get in, baby! You know, buckle up. And so anyway, that happens in uh, Song Song six eleven. He shows up in his chariot. She jumps in. They ride off, and um, and he tells her how great she looks today. 
uh, et cetera, and they have a dialogue. And then finally, we have a concluding colloquy. Everybody comes back out on stage, and the bride, the groom, and the chorus all have a speaking part at the, uh, at the end of the book. So that's the structure. Well, question is, you know, what does the Song of Song have to do with the rest of the Bible? You know, how does this... How does this point to Jesus? We're talking about wisdom, too, in this conference, and so we want to tie that in. We know that Christ is our ultimate wisdom, so somehow the song must connect to Christ. But you read a lot of commentaries, and they don't, you know, these commentators don't know what to do with this, uh, what, what to do with this book. And uh, even some of the commentators uh, will say, well, you know, it's essentially ignored by the New Testament. But that's not true. The Song of Songs is not ignored by the New Testament. It's particularly uh, 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 drawn on by the Gospel of John. And uh, we're going to look at that and see what the Gospel of John does with the song. And this is going to lead us into uniting the song with the uh, wisdom tradition, the wisdom literature, and, and ultimately seeing the song as the climax of the wisdom literature. So we're going to begin with one example of how the Gospel of John uses the Song of Song and applies it to Jesus, and that's in terms of the bridegroom's body. And uh, I don't want to give too much away, so we're just going to uh, go through this. But this is now from um, the second dream sequence of the Song of Songs. I want to read a little passage here. This is where the bride is going out at night and she's searching for her beloved and she finds her girlfriends to give her a hand to find her, her beloved. And the girlfriends are like, yeah, why should we waste our time looking for your, your guy? You know, why is he so special? So here we get some words in the, in the, um, in the mouth of the daughters of uh, Jerusalem. What is your beloved more than any other beloved, O fairest among women? What is your beloved more than any other beloved that you thus adjure us, adjure us to help you find him? And the bride is only too happy to go into a description of what her uh, groom-to-be looks like. My beloved is all radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold, thus the image there. His locks are wavy, black as raven. His eyes are like doves beside springs of water, bathed in milk, fitly set. His cheeks are like beds of spices, yielding fragrance. His lips are lilies, distilling liquid myrrh. His arms are rounded gold, set with jewels. His body is ivory work, encrusted with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns, set upon bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His speech is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, um, unfortunately, my animations aren't working here. I had a couple images that were going to flash on the screen there. But as we look at um, this description, you know, the beds of spices and this fragrance, the liquid myrrh, but then the rounded gold set with jewels, the ivory work, the sapphires, alabaster columns, bases of gold, cedars of Lebanon. Do you recognize what is being described in ancient Israel in this description of her bridegroom's body? You know, where are all these items found? That's right. I think I'm hearing it. The temple. That's right. Okay, the temple is where you're going to find uh, columns on bases of gold. The temple is where you're going to find rounded gold encrusted with jewels. Uh, The temple is where you're going to smell the myrrh and uh, the other fragrances in the incense that was used to sense the Holy of Holies. She is describing the body of her groom as if he were the temple in Jerusalem. That is the point. His body is sacred. His body is a temple. But then if you look at this imagery as well, and you think, hmm, when in my religious experience as a Catholic, do I ever smell the sense of frankincense and myrrh? 
When do I behold something that's made of rounded gold and set with jewels that has maybe other precious materials worked in and encrusted with sapphires and built on a a column of gold, on a base of gold? When do I ever experience this? And you are probably thinking with me, you know, He has given them bread from heaven. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Having all sweetness within it. Cha-ching, cha-ching. Right? Worth, this is the imagery of like solemn benediction, right? And I have a monstrance up on the screen, okay, which is like a column of gold encrusted with jewels. And it's not that we as Catholics, like, you know, we're so exegetically self conscious that we went back to Psalm. Uh, you know, the Song of Songs, you know, chapter 6 or 5, and, 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 and got this imagery and decided to incorporate it. But there's something deep in our nature that we know that when we build a monstrance, we're building something that's for the adoration of the body of our bridegroom. And so it's just instinctive to use the most precious materials possible, and we end up, as it were, reinventing the wheel and using the same materials that the ancient Israelites used to adorn the home of their God, right, in the temple in Jerusalem. But there's this profound connection. And this, by the way, is an excellent text um, <clears throat> Uh, to be used here in, uh, this is from Song 5, this is an excellent text to be used in Eucharistic adoration. All right, so where do we see this in the New Testament? Well, again, the Gospel of John. Let's think of an episode that maybe might not uh, uh, immediately occur to us, but the temple cleansing in John chapter 2. We know how that goes. Our Lord makes a whip of cords and he drives out all the money changers from the temple. And of course, the Judeans are not real happy about this. And so they say to him, what sign have you to show us for doing this? And he answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Judeans said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days. But he spoke of the temple of his body. Wow. What an image. And then we go searching. Well, what would prepare the people of God to receive a man whose body is a temple? And there's a couple of trajectories in Scripture that actually lead in this direction. But one of the more important ones is what we just looked at. In the Song of Songs, Solomon, the royal bridegroom, he is described by his bride as one with a temple body. And indeed, that's what our Lord is as well. The temple of his body uh, harks back in part to this imagery from the Song of Songs. What else does the New Testament do with the song, in particular the Gospel of John? Well, there's also the motif of the anointing of the reclining king. We see this in the Song of Songs, chapter 1. We have this dialogue going on. And up on the screen, I've divided the dialogue between the different speaking parts here. So you can see what lines belong in the mouth of the groom and what belong in the mouth of the chorus and what in the bride. This is clear in Hebrew because Hebrew has um, uh, gendered endings on the uh, nouns and the verbs, etc., and you can see uh, the gender of who's being addressed and, and who's speaking, etc. But uh, in any event, so in verse 1 9, it's a, there's a dialogue going on between the groom and the bride, and he says to the, his bride, I compare you, my love, to a mare of Pharaoh's chariots. A little digression here, it's a little bit of a humorous comment that's going on. You see, Pharaoh did not have any mares among his chariots, okay? The Egyptian cavalry consisted entirely of stallions. Why is that? Well, one reason is stallions are a little bit larger and better for battle than mares. But secondly, you cannot mix mares and stallions in a fighting force, okay? In fact, if you were even to lead a mare past the Egyptian cavalry 
all those war horses would quickly lose all thought of combat <laughs> and become solely interested in that one mare, okay? And become completely unruly and uncontrollable, and you could not maintain military discipline. Uh, among these horses. So there were no mares, okay, within the Egyptian cavalry. And so I compare you, my love, to a mare of Pharaoh's chariots. This is a little subtle joke. It's like you arouse such passion in me, you know, that I can't think about anything else, and I become disorganized, and all I want to think about is, is you. That's uh, what, the, what the groom is saying. Your cheeks are coming with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Then the chorus, the daughters of uh, Zion or Jerusalem, uh, chime in and say, We will make you ornaments of gold studded with silver. And then the bride responds, While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a bag of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. These are some henna blossoms here on the image. Okay, so beautiful image. But let's look at that line in verse 12. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. Are you having a little bit of uh, preja vu uh, with that verse? Uh, have you seen that later? In the Bible, uh, indeed you have, because you're all familiar with John 12, right? In John 12, we get uh, the gospel account of the anointing at Bethany. And Mary took a pound of costly ointment of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. St. John says, huh, so that in case we missed it, in case we momentarily forgot that the only other book of the Bible that mentions Nard is the Song of Songs, and if case that wasn't enough to clue us into the deeper significance, John emphasizes the fragrance filled the whole house, and we as the readers are sort of like, why is he mentioning that? Oh, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance, okay? So what Mary is doing to the Lord is unwittingly identifying Jesus as the new Solomon, as the new royal bridegroom come to wed himself to his people, which was prophetically foreshadowed in the Song of Songs, And then uh, uh, the account goes on, and we know that Judas protests, why wasn't this sold and the money given to the poor, etc., although he didn't really care about the poor. But then uh, Jesus says, let her alone, okay? Let her keep it for the day of my burial. And that statement seems to imply that uh, she did not use up all the nard yet, that there's some of the nard is still left in the bottle. And so we, we might fill it in by saying, let her keep the rest of it, okay, for the day of my burial. And I find that very significant because what Jesus is doing is taking this, uh, this nuptial perfume, okay, this nard uh, is this, this romantic uh, uh, fragrance, you know, comparable to, you know, Chanel number no. 5 or, uh, you know, one by Dolce & Gabbana or other things that you can't afford in the duty-free shop in the, in, the, in the airport, right? I always find that ironic. Like, you ever wonder about that? Like, well, big whoop that it's tax-free. Like, yeah, oh, wow, I'm going to really save money now. I don't have to pay taxes on this. Like, $200 for five ounces. Like, oh, I'm saving money here, you know. I don't have to pay taxes. Save at least 15 bucks on this $200 purchase. Like, I mean, I don't know. It's duty free. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I just find that ironic. Like, oh, I'm going to save money. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> but, uh, but the, the nard is this very expensive fragrance, like high class and associated with romance and associated with marriage. 
And so Jesus takes all that imagery and says, you know what? Everything that this nard symbolizes, the reference to the great love poem of the Bible, which is the only other book that uses nard, that is more appropriate at my burial. Like, really, Lord? Wedding imagery is appropriate to your burial? Lord, weddings and funerals are different, okay? They're like, you know, one is match, the other is dispatch, you know? You, you, don't, you don't mix the two, okay? Wasn't there a movie like Three Weddings and a Funeral or something like that? I was like, you know, don't, you know, keep those apart, you know? Uh, that, that's kind of weird, but no. As we're going to see, our Lord's burial ends up being his mystical wedding. So, we've seen the, uh, the bridegroom's body, you know, and the body, the temple body of our Lord. We've seen the anointing of the reclining king. And then there's the motif of the royal wedding crown. In Song 3, the beginning of the longest section of the book, where Solomon is being brought up into Jerusalem in his uh, palanquin, or his, like, uh, room on poles. Here's, a, here's an ancient one up on the screen to give you an idea of, you know, how it might have looked like a little bit. What is that coming up from the wilderness like a column of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense? Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. About it are 60 mighty men of the mighty men of Israel, all girt with swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh. Okay, so here comes Solomon. He's perfumed uh, up, you know, he's got so much cologne on, you can see the column of, you know, cologne vapor, you know, wearing so much Stetson, you could smell it from like about 10 miles away, like, what's that? Oh, that's Solomon coming, okay, so here he comes up from Jericho, you know, up the road into Jerusalem, you can, like, you can smell him wafted on the breezes, and Here's that litter of Solomon. He's surrounded by soldiers. Okay. And then it goes on. King Solomon made himself a palanquin from the wood of Lebanon. So he's being carried up on the wood, right? Made its post of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. Okay. So he's wearing the nuptial crown, the crown of his wedding, we don't know for sure, but uh, we suspect that this would be a, like a crown of foliage, um, of, of vines and flowers to represent the, uh, the joy of the royal wedding, uh, similar to, you know, the laurel crowns that the Greeks and the Romans used for a victor or uh, for a triumphant person or for some great public celebration. Um, you know, it, it celebrates joy and nature and uh, all of that good stuff. So um, here, here's a, an ancient uh, 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 engraving with a, with a hero, you know, guard with one of these foliage crowns. So how does that relate to our Lord? Where is that imagery taken up in the Gospels? I can't prove this, but I suspect here... Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. So here we have the son of David surrounded by soldiers, right? Just like the Song of Songs describes Solomon, each with with his sword at his side. Here our Lord, in a very ironic way, surrounded by soldiers, and these soldiers make him a crown of foliage, okay? But it's a crown of thorns, And they put that on his head, Hail, King of the Jews. And they also provide a wooden vehicle for him to ride on that we call the cross. So we've got that vehicle of wood. We've got the soldiers surrounding. We've got that that crown. Um, It can't be proven exegetically, but at least in the level of Lexio, uh, we can meditate on the crown of thorns as the nuptial crown of our Lord as he goes to give his body for his bride uh, in the Passion. So we've looked at three images so far in the song that are taken up in the Gospel of John. Let's look at a fourth motif, the garden and the virgin bride. So here we go to the heart of the Song of Songs in chapter 4, which the context for which I believe is 
we, we are like a fly on the wall uh, inside the bridal litter of Solomon, and his, he's seated on one side on his couch, and she's seated maybe facing him on a couch, and they're being carried up by, uh, by the soldiers into Jerusalem with royal pomp and great celebration. And we listen to the dialogue as uh, they, uh, they exchange terms of endearment. And uh, Solomon says of his bride, A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A garden locked, a fountain sealed. And of course, these images of being locked and sealed, this is because she's kept herself exclusively uh, for her royal bridegroom. She's never been with anyone else. Um, so she is, as it were, a virgin garden. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits. Henna with nard, nard and saffron. There we get the nard again. Calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes. Especially notice the myrrh and aloes there. With all chief spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. And then she responds to her groom and says, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden, which is her body, and let its fragrance be wafted abroad. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. And it's, it's, uh, it's beautiful in the Song of Songs that as the curtain drops on this central scene, as bride and groom are approaching for Uh, For the nuptial embrace, the curtain drops and the chorus chimes in, eat and drink deeply, O lovers. That's what the daughters of Zion say uh, as they approach one another. Isn't that beautiful that in the Song of Songs, the embrace of husband and wife is described in culinary imagery, okay, as eating and drinking one another? Hmm, I wonder where that's going, okay? (laughs) Where do we have, you know, the celebration of a wedding feast where the consummation of the bodies really takes place through an act of eating and drinking? Well, you know where we're going with that. And that's why the Song of Songs speaks to us really about the Mass. But where does it go in the Gospel of John? So we had that garden imagery, that virgin imagery, garden locked, fountain sealed. Okay, we had... um, uh, uh, we had that, the, the, uh, the mention of myrrh and aloes as these fragrances that adorn the bodies of the lovers back there in Song uh, 4. Now look at this episode. This is the burial. Remember how Jesus said, let her save the nard for my burial? Okay, so here we're back. Our Lord himself suggested all that imagery belongs appropriately at my death. Well, here it is. Here's his death and burial. Nicodemus also who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes. Wow. Now, did you know that myrrh and aloes are only used in the Old Testament in marital contexts? They're used in a scene, uh, in a, in a, uh, frankly, a seduction scene in Proverbs 7 mentions myrrh and aloes. Uh, The royal wedding psalm in Psalm 45 mentions myrrh and aloes. And then the only other place where myrrh and aloes are mentioned is the Song of Songs. So the only association of myrrh and aloes in the Old Testament is with romance, okay? So here comes Nicodemus bringing this mixture of myrrh and aloes. About a hundred pounds weight, okay? That's a lot, right? (laughs) What, what, how are myrrh, you know, how, but what unit of measure is usually used for selling colognes and perfumes? Ounces, right, okay? So five ounces is like 50 bucks, you know, in the duty-free shop. But <laughs> tax-free, okay, right? But what unit of measure are we, are we using here? Pounds, right. Pounds, a hundred pounds. There's eight pounds in a gallon. You could do the math and figure out how many gallons this is. But this is like Chanel number five in the 15 gallon keg. <laughs> Open the tab there. Glug, 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 glug. Okay. This is, this is literally a burial fit for a king, really fit for an emperor. 
Okay? And there's a backstory to this. We know Nicodemus' family. There's an archaeological record. He was a very wealthy Pharisee. Okay? This, is his, this is probably his family's whole stash of myrrh and aloes that was expected to cover all major life events for the family for generations, you know, all weddings and burials, etc., for the whole Nicodemus family. And he clears out the whole storage room and brings everything he's got and just smothers it over the body of Jesus. This was a social statement about what he thought about this teacher of Nazareth. Remember, Nicodemus was the guy protesting the legal proceedings that were going against Jesus. Like, hey, wait, 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 you know, we're, you know, point of order, point of order. You know, we got to call the guy in and interview him. And, and he's just getting shout, shouted down by the rest of uh, the Congress, right? The this, this Sanhedrin there. And so he protested this. And so he brings out his whole store of myrrh and aloes. And remember that Calvary was in no secret place, nor was the garden where our Lord was buried. It was right beside the most public road into Jerusalem, one of the main entrances, because the Romans crucified people in public so that everybody got the point. This is what happens to you when you disobey Roman authority. So Nicodemus is pouring out this myrrh and aloes in front of, you know, who's ever coming past the main road. And Nicodemus is a nationally known figure. He's like a major senator, you know, like Marco Rubio or, you know, uh, you know Rick Santorum or, you know, uh, somebody else that, um, that uh, maybe is not the president but is a major player and, um, and would be a nationally known uh, name, okay? So here's Nicodemus, and he is doing this in public. I tell you, you, know, you find out who your friends are when you're dead, Okay, like, who shows up to help you out when you're dead? Okay, that's when your true friends are revealed. And I'm always moved by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus because these two guys show up when Jesus is dead. Everybody else runs away, even the apostles. You know, I just these men's faith. You know, to be there with the Lord. And sometimes that's how it feels with the church, doesn't it? Just like, how can it get any worse some days? You know, you think confusion, feels like we're close to schism. The gospel is obscured by things that are said in public. You know, people think that all religions are the same. You don't have to come to Jesus for salvation. Like, you know, confusion about sexual identity and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, oh, Lord, you know. How can the gospel get out through all this mess that is the church, you know? And just feel like our, our hopes are lost. But that's the time for faith. Okay? That's the time for sainthood. That's the time to be with Jesus even when it seems like he's dead because we are resurrection people. Amen? Amen. And what's true of our Lord is true of his church. Amen? Amen. And we will rise to a new evangelization. Amen? Amen. So take courage from Joseph of Arimathea. Take courage from Nicodemus. Be identified with Jesus and his body, which is the church. This is what Nicodemus is doing. He's identifying himself with Jesus' body. And we know that Jesus' body is the church, even when Jesus' body looks like it's dead. You know? And there's some parts of the country where it feels like the church is dead. You know? Where just there's been disasters, there's been scandals, and it feels like nobody's coming to Mass, and you've got all these empty buildings... Okay, pray to St. Nicodemus. And don't be ashamed to be identified with the body of the Lord, because guess what? That body's coming back. Okay? So be bold. Be bold. So here he is. But he comes bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes. That's our imagery back from Song 4. And... uh, uh, binds it with the linen cloths. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. Well, that's providential. Okay? Huh. And in the garden, a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. Huh. Well, if nobody's ever been laid in it, then it is a virgin tomb, right? And as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. These are these motifs from Song 4 coming back. The myrrh and aloes, the pleasant scents, the garden, the, the virginal tomb. The tomb of, uh, of our Lord, the Holy Sepulchre, is a mystical representation of the body of Christ. It's a mystical representation of the church. 
Okay? In a sense, the Holy Sepulchre is the mother church of Christianity. In another sense, St. John Lateran is. But we can view the Holy Sepulchre as a kind of mother church, as it all starts there. And think about the relationship between the Holy Sepulchre and the Blessed Mother and her womb. Let's think about womb and tomb. So our Lord comes down from heaven, bounds down from heaven, like in Song 2, and takes flesh in the virginal womb of the mother. And then at the end of his life, he gives his flesh into the virginal tomb of the Holy Sepulcher. And the womb of the Blessed Mother gives birth to him on Christmas. The womb of the Holy Sepulcher gives birth to him on Easter. There's this mystical correlation, and lest you think that I'm just drawing on the rhyme of womb and tomb in English, let's remember that the womb and the tomb are associated again and again in the Old Testament. Does not Job say, naked I came forth from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return, right? Is he going to literally return to his mother's womb? No, he's going to be put in a hole in the ground. He's going to be put in a grave. But somehow this grave is a return to the womb. Psalm 139, the great pro-life psalm, right? My frame was not hidden from you when I was knit together in my mother's womb, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. That's what Psalm 139 says. How can you be formed in the depths of the earth and also be knit together in your mother's womb? Well, I don't know. But it's this mystical like womb of mother earth concept. But the, the Psalm 139 both describes us as, as being formed in the ground and also being formed in our mama's womb. So it associates the two, okay? And Ecclesiastes also says, naked we come forth and naked we shall return. So the Old Testament itself associates the womb of the mother with the tomb of the earth. And this is what we see in the Gospel of John. And so very appropriately, as he's returning to the womb of the mother in his death, our Lord, is placed in a virginal tomb, which is a mystical symbol of the body of Christ, who is embodied in the Blessed Mother, right? Do we not say that she is an icon of the whole church? But then here's the kicker. Who is it that places Jesus in the Holy Sepulcher after smothering him with 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes? It's Nicodemus, right? Okay. What did Nicodemus ask our Lord back in John 3 when they had that dialogue at night? How can a man return for a second time to his mother's womb? And he's the one there preparing the body as Jesus returns for a second time to the virginal womb where he's going to be reborn. But that's a sign of baptism, Because baptism is a participation in the death and burial of Christ. Romans 6, do you not know that you were buried with him in baptism? So each one of us returns to the mother's womb through baptism. We go back and we're buried and we go into the womb of Mother Earth, as it were. We experience a sacramental death and then we rise from the waters as on Easter and we participate in, our Christ, in Christ's rebirth through resurrection. And that's the deeper meaning. This is, this is how that's applied to us. So this is beautiful imagery about Jesus being buried. So how, what does it mean to me? This is about your baptism, brothers and sisters. This is what you undergo, what you have undergone. And marks your whole life because our baptism is renewed every day. Okay, our whole life is lived under under the sign of our baptism. Okay, so uh, the burial of our Lord draws from the imagery of uh, the song. But then also our Lord's resurrection carries that motif of the bride's nighttime search. We've talked about this before And uh, you might be uh, even more aware of this because uh, earlier this week, uh, I believe it was on Monday, it was the Feast of St. Mary Magdalene. And Song 3 was the first reading or the first option for the first reading if you went to daily Mass on her feast day. And in Song 3, verse 1, we have one of these two dream sequences in the song. And the bride says, "'Upon my bed by night I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not.'" 
I called him, but he gave no answer. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house, into the chamber of her that conceived me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles of the hinds, the gazelles or the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor awaken love until it please. Well, let's look at how this comes to play at the end of the Gospel of John. In John 20, verse 1, we read, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. If it's still dark, then in my categories, it's still night. Okay? Still night. And saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. What does the song say? Upon my bed by night, I sought him whom my soul loves. So out in the night, here is Mary Magdalene, searching for the one whom her soul loves. She does not find Jesus at the tomb, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And what does the song say? I'll rise now, go about in the city, in the streets and squares, I will seek him. So she's running around, trying to find help to seek him. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the feet. In the song, she encounters the watchers who found her as she went about the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? And the, uh, the, the relationship is even stronger if you're an ancient Jew in the first century because one of the terms for angels in first century Judaism was the watchers, the watchers of heaven. Okay, so she, ca- she encounters the heavenly watchers. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing, but did not know that it was Jesus. Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. So no sooner does she see the angels, she turns around, there is Jesus. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, tell me where you have laid him. I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. If Jesus has to say to her, Do not hold me, what is that implying? That's right. She's grabbing on to him and doesn't want to let him go, as it says in the songs. Scarcely had I passed him, I found him in my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go. But Mary has to learn that Jesus is the spouse for all. And uh, she cannot hold on to him. She uh, needs, as, all we, as we all do, to share our Lord as the spouse of the whole church. Yes, he comes for each one of us personally, but not for each one of us alone. He comes for all. He is the bridegroom of, of each of our souls. So this is what the Gospel of John does with the Song of Songs. It describes Jesus using these powerful romantic images from the song, presenting Jesus as our bridegroom. But this is the same gospel that also portrays our Lord, (coughs) as the other gospels do as well, as the embodiment of wisdom. I mean, from the very beginning of the book, the word, the logos, and logos is this idea of rationality, of like the philosophical principles that undergird the fabric of reality in the Greek tradition. The logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And likewise in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth. And that's what the wisdom tradition sought after. It sought after truth. It sought after chokhmah, uh, wisdom, which is grasping reality as it is. So this gospel identifies Jesus as, with these bridegroom images from the Song of Songs, but also as truth and as wisdom and as logos. Well, what is the Song of Songs in light of the Gospel of John telling us about wisdom? Well, some of these things have already been mentioned before. As um, uh, Dr. Shri uh, just said in his talk, truth is a person. That's why the Song of Songs should be read as the climax of the wisdom literature. The wisdom literature is an intellectual journey toward God by learning the principles of creation and life and how to live. But that journey 
does not culminate in a formula. It culminates in a person. And this is where contemporary intellectuals go wrong. I have an avocation for science. I love to watch science videos and keep up with science literature. You know, I've read stuff by Stephen Hawking, by Isaac Asimov, by uh, Robert Jastrow, the great rocket scientist of the 20th century. Uh, some of these names may be familiar to you. I love their work and, and their, their, their scientific investigations of the fabric of the universe. But where all these guys go wrong is they're all seeking a grand unified theory. They want something like E equals MC squared that explains all of reality, maybe with more variables and some more uh, 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 functions involved in that formula. But they're basically looking like for a formula that's going to describe reality. And I'm sorry, gentlemen, you're not going to find it. A formula, a grand unified theory does not finally undergird reality. What undergirds reality is a person. And that person in particular is the second person of the Trinity who is the divine rationality that is not only E equals MC squared, Jesus is that, but he's also your spouse of your soul. And that's why some of the great intellectuals of the 20th and 21st century, it's kind of sad because they die without encountering the person who is the truth. And that's another point. Reality is ultimately personal. They've even found this out to be true from quantum physics. I can't go into this right now, but when you get to the very smallest, most basic level of reality, you begin to see that mind controls matter. And mental decisions of the researcher dictate how the particles are going to behave. I know it sounds wild. You're like, really? Is that really true? It is true. It's been confirmed by so many experiments. I wish this was wider known. I wish it was taught in high schools. Why do you think it's not taught in high schools? Yeah, that's right. Because the high school system, our public education system, has a vested interest in teaching kids that matter and energy is all there is, and there's no meaning and so on, and uh, there's, there's no ultimate personal or mind, etc. But what the science actually shows is there's a mind at the basis of reality, when you get down to the very basis of it, which is the same thing that the scriptures are telling us, that there was a mind and a person before there was any matter. And then that mind and that person said, let there be light. And then matter became, came into existence. The Song of Songs also teaches us the limitations of words. A lot of the songs is just visual description. Three times the groom just looks at the body of his bride and describes what he sees. And once the the bride just looks at the groom and describes what she sees as she's looking at him. So for a lot of the Song of Songs, they're really just looking at each other. Does that give you a kind of preja vu? Okay. What do we talk about, like the ultimate act of looking? We don't call it the beatific conversation, folks. Okay. We, We call it the beatific vision. And the Song of Songs is a very visual book where the lovers gaze at one another in the gaze of love. And that's what we're going to do for eternity. You see, because after 10,000 years, we're going to get it all talked out, right? We're going to find out why it was that you fell off your high chair when you were three years old. You're like, how was that in God's providence? You know, you're going to find out why you broke down in Albuquerque when you were 22 trying to drive across country. You're like, I never, that seemed like a disaster. I always wondered why Jesus willed that way. We're going to find out all that. We're going to get all worked out. Like, explain, okay, this is why everything happened. And, oh, we're happy that we're all now in heaven. Like, and what do we talk about now? Well, even when we run out of things to talk about, We will gaze in love at Jesus, our spouse. Just like that old couple sitting on the park bench, holding hands and looking at each other. They're both like 85, and there's nothing left to say. (laughs) They've already discussed the kids to the, you know, there's nothing more to say about the kids. They don't want to talk about politics, you know. All right, there's nothing to say about that. You know what? But they're still in love. So when you're 85 and you're sitting on the park bench with your spouse and you hold hands, you know what? I can't think of a darn thing to say, but I still love you. That's the beatific vision. Okay? 
There are things that go beyond words, that go beyond discourse. Philosophy ultimately falls silent. And then there's just the gaze of adoration. I'm going to just skip to the end here. The gaze of adoration. That's what the Song of Songs is all about. It's all about adoration. We saw that already with when she looks at her bridegroom and he looks like a monstrance, right? Gold and encrusted jewels and all that, right? Think of this word adoration. I love it. It's the perfect word for the Psalms because on the one hand, we got adore, like, oh, she's adorable or I adore her. We use it as a word for love or for romance. But then adoration is also a word for worship. And so the word captures just that right balance of love and worship. That is what the quest for wisdom ought to lead to. That's what the quest for wisdom led the the three guys that we call the wise men in Scripture, right? The three wise men, they were the scientists of their day. And they come and they look for truth and they find truth in a person. In fact, in a baby, And then they bring gifts along, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Did you know all three of those are mentioned heavily in the Song of Songs? And did you know frankincense and myrrh are mentioned together only in the Song of Songs? So these three wise men, the wisest men in the Bible in a sense, these great scientists of their day, they fulfilled their quest for truth by finding it in a person and ending on their knees in an act of adoration. May we be wise men and women too. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the beauty of what you revealed in Scripture. Now bless us as we meditate on it throughout this conference. May all our growth in understanding lead us to a growth of love and worship of you. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much.